I'm ITV's Judge Rinder. I've been a criminal barrister for over a decade. I'm going to be examining cases that have shocked the nation. In today's programme, a vulnerable man goes missing. Well, remember saying to Duncan, you know, I reckon he's dead. Like, everything's just gone. You know, your whole world's collapsed. But the truth behind his disappearance is even more sinister than could ever have been imagined. He was forced to work, ultimately treated like an animal, for 13 years. This was an horrendous crime. It blew away the myth that slavery was all about girls and women being brought from Africa or Eastern Europe. And later, a grieving widow's inheritance is taken. I sold all my jewellery because I needed the money to go out and buy food and everything. She kept it secret from me because she was embarrassed about it. She'd embarrassed it, she'd let it happen. And the shocking betrayal tears a family apart. I couldn't believe that my brother could do that to my mum. This is Judge Rinder's crime story. This is a story of Daryl Simister and a crime that seems almost impossible to imagine in modern-day Britain. An offence so cruel, so degrading, that it left an entire family, as I suspect it will you at home, in shock. This is the case of Daryl Simister. Kidderminster in Worcestershire, which lies on the River Severn, where on the 4th of October 1969, Daryl Simister was born. Eldest son of Jean and Tony. He was a lovely baby. He was very bright. And up until he got to the age of about nine months, we'd had no health issues with him at all. And at nine months, he started having convulsions. I gave him some medication. Um, but nothing, there was never any answer to what it was that caused the problem. Um, I think they went down the route that he'd got hot, his temperature had got to a certain point, and we were advised to keep him cool at all times. When he went to school at five, he came off his medication and he went to a mainstream school. Jean and Tony went on to have three more children, Brendan, Duncan and daughter Zoe. But despite Daryl being the oldest, his health problems had made their mark. But you always was aware that he was a little bit behind his age group sort of thing. So, and obviously me being like three years younger was sort of like more my age group than he was my older brother sort of thing. I was always fighting his battles for him. He was a model pupil but not an intelligent pupil. And of course, hindsight has now told us the reason why. You know, he's autistic, and autistic children have difficulty in taking stuff in. But of course, it wasn't put, put before us back in the day. Although Darrell left school with no qualifications, it didn't stop him from finding work. Darrell did that, got a job, went to work, never missed any time from work. He'd been brought up the proper way, you work for your living. So, never a problem. He'd go to work if he was ill. When Daryl was 27, he decided it was time to leave home and to stand on his own two feet. He's got in with a family that he'd go in and have a drink with at the end of the week. And uh, they've asked him to go and live with them. He used to work with them as well. And then um, he popped down to see mom and dad to say he was going on holiday to Wales the people he was living with. And he said, I'm going in the morning. He said, and uh, I'll come and see you when we get back and I can tell you all about it. Said, yeah, that's lovely, have a nice holiday. But on Sunday the 20th of August 2000, the weekend he was due back from his holiday, it wasn't Daryl who paid Jean a visit. I get a knock on the door and this girl tells me she's Daryl's fiance, which we'd never heard about. And she tells me that uh, while they'd been away, there'd been a big argument, and Daryl's just basically walked out and off he went. I've then rung the police and said, oh, you know, what's happened? This lady's been and told me that he's missing in Wales. We need to report him as missing. He's got no mobile phone. 
So he doesn't get, we can't get in touch with him. And it, it sort of, it's all from there, it's like everything's just gone. You know, your whole world's collapsed like. But a week after Daryl's disappearance, the family were offered some hope. We get a phone call and it's this Irish chap telling me they've got Daryl. I said, OK, right, can you tell me where you are? Come and fetch him. Ah, uh, he's not coming home. He wants to come to work with us. We're travellers and we go all around the country, tarmacking, roadworks, different jobs. I said, can you put him on the phone, please? So Daryl came on the phone. I said, mate, what's the matter? Oh, I'm going to work with these. Uh, they've offered me a job and somewhere to live. I said, tell me where you are, I'll come and fetch you. I said, y you don't need to go to work for them. I said, you come home, I'll sort you out of town. He said, I want to make a new life for myself. Like he's 30 years old. You know, if he wants to choose to go and live somewhere else, we accept that. Didn't like it, but we have to accept it. And, you know, we've said, you, you must phone and let us know you're OK and keep in contact. Can you give us an address? No, I can't give you an address. Well, why not? Well, we're on the move all the time. OK, something else you have to accept. With Daryl seemingly happy to stay, there was little that Jean and Tony could do. In the first year, I think we had two phone calls off him. And he was full of himself. Oh, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm enjoying it. He sounded like he was happy. So I was happy, but his mum wasn't. Probably about 18 months after he'd gone missing, the phone calls, you could always hear somebody in the background. And we used to say, they must have it on speakerphone and you can hear, hear them in the background because you could ask Darrell a question and he wouldn't give you the answer that we knew he should have given us. And we've had him tell us that he's living in Ireland, in Cork, that he's married to a lady by the name of Mary. They've got one baby and there's another one on the way. And you're thinking, well, you didn't tell me nothing like this the last time you called. And from that day, I knew that he was being told what to say and he was being held against his will. As a family's concerns grew, they contacted the police once again. And I kept reporting and kept reporting to our local police and telling them, you know, he's, he's vulnerable. And we feel he's being held against his will because we, he won't give us an address. You know, the phone number that they, we've used now doesn't answer. It just goes to an answer phone. We've got no way of getting in touch with him. We just have to wait and hope that he'll phone us. So the police came taking statements, blah, blah, blah. But it was always coming back. But Mr. Simister, you must realise your son's asked that he wants to make a new life for himself down there. He isn't a missing person. He's a missing contact. Jean and Tony Simister were doing everything they could to try and find their son. But as each Christmas went by and each New Year's came, Daryl's absence grew even more painful. Although the family didn't know it, during the Christmas of 2008, they received what was to be their very last phone call from Daryl. He says, um, I'll ring you in the new year. He says, I'll speak to you then. 2009 came and went and into 2010, and then it's becoming, it's a problem now. So we're even more um, onto the police and playing up more and more. I remember saying to Duncan, um, you know, I reckon he's dead because he wouldn't, Daryl wouldn't do that to us. I know he only rings every now and again, but at least he rings. The family had all but given up hope of ever seeing Daryl again. Because Daryl was over the age of 18 and left of his own accord, there's very little the police could do other than report him as a missing adult. In law, unless the police are satisfied that a person who has disappeared is in danger or at risk, there is very little they can do. In this case, they simply put it down to Daryl being out of contact with his family. 
For Daryl's parents, however, the wait was an agonizing nightmare. After the break, Daryl's mum receives some shocking news. This lady phones me and she says, I'm 95% certain I know where your son is. I'm like, that's not my son. As he walked closer and closer towards me, bent over, hardly putting one foot in front of another. And the true horror of Daryl's last 13 years would soon be revealed. The doctors checked him over, and there was the teeth, chest infection, his feet. He got curvature of the spine, malnutrition. It had been over a decade since Daryl's family had any idea of his whereabouts. And although they'd had intermittent contact, it had been three years since they'd had any communication at all with their son. But Daryl's parents refused to end their tireless search. After several more years of trying to locate Daryl, the family finally got a lead that he was still in Wales. And in February 2013, they made the decision to contact the editors of a local newspaper to ask for help. I remember when I first saw Jean's email, I thought my heart fell a little bit because I thought it's another missing person email. It's so unlikely that we'll be able to help her. Probably a few paragraphs in, I realized that this wasn't a normal missing person case. Claire agreed to write an article, which was published on the 25th of February. So we described the whole background of what had happened. We described what Daryl might look like now. We had a photo of him from 13 years ago, looking really young. And we ran an appeal on a double-page spread in a newspaper. And I did warn Jean. I said, you know, it's, it's quite unusual for anyone, really, to get in touch after an appeal like this. We'll try our best. But quite often, you know, maybe the right people don't read it, or they do, but they don't want to say anything. So it's gone out in the paper, gone out online nothing that day, nothing the next day. And then on the Wednesday night, <sighs> this lady phones me and she says, I'm 95% certain I know where your son is. So she comes back into the lounge and tears streaming down her face. I think we know where Daryl is. What? 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 She gave us a pub address uh, in Wales and said, if you go to the pub, he's not far from that particular area. There's some fields and that you'll see him working in the fields. They gave me the address and I knew it was a farm um, in an area of Cardiff that does have a lot of Irish traveller um, families and, and communities down there. And because of the previous descriptions they'd given about the phone number being linked to a paving firm as well, I, su I did suspect that it might be that he was working for travellers. Accompanied by youngest son Duncan, the couple headed to Wales as soon as they could, desperately praying that this wasn't a hoax call. We went to the pub address that we was given, um, looked around, couldn't find him, and I said, come on, we'll just have a drive out further up the road and, you know, just 
just see if we can see anything. And I just happened to glance somebody hunched over pushing a wheelbarrow, and I don't know what it was, but something just said, I think, I think that's your brother. Um, <clears throat> so just give us two minutes. Walked over and it was Daryl, but not the Daryl that I was expecting to see. After 13 long years, Duncan was finally face to face with his older brother. He kept looking over his shoulder, carried on with his work, and just something just didn't feel right by the way he was acting. He's come to the car, he says, we've got him. He says, he's in a right state. He says, he didn't recognise me. I thought it was perhaps best that the police were called and at least you got somebody there with a, you know, an authority figure that if there is something wrong, he's going to feel safe, you know, when you approach him. The police arrived and entered the farm to find Daryl. And I can remember seeing the policeman call this man to him and he was bent over all like an old man and uh, that's not my son and then i heard him say your dad's outside go and have a chat with your dad sent this old man to me and i i'm like that's not my son as he walked closer and closer towards me bent over hardly putting one foot in front of another i knew it was daryl so he's come to me and I've gone, mate, what sort of mess are you in? Put my arms around him to give him a hug. And honestly, I'll, I'll never, ever forget the smell. It was vile. He was a right mess. But I still went and hugged him. It was like winning the lottery to have him. Seeing him after all that time. But he, he was, oh, he just smelled absolutely disgusting. After finding their beloved son, Jean and Tony wasted no time in getting him back home. So Duncan shot off to get Daryl some clothes. Daryl went in the shower and I told him, I said, as soon as you finish, give me a shout and I'll come in and give you a check over. So I looked inside his mouth and it was horrendous. Absolutely. He needed the dentist ASAP. I've looked at his feet. They were green. The doctors checked him over, and there was the teeth, chest infection, his feet. He got curvature of the spine, malnutrition. As he began to recover, Daryl gradually revealed to his family the horrors of what had happened to him over the past 13 years. He took me to work for two days to do some brick lane and stuff. Went back to the caravan, Friday, and then the following day, he said, come on, I'll take you down to my father's farm to work there instead. He showed me around the farm where all the horses was kept, but he didn't even ask me about money at all. He told me to feed the horses out, well, bring them out every morning, give them water, put them back in the shed, uh, give them hay, give them feed. He said, when you've done all that, start cleaning them all out. And then there was two big barns to clean out. There were five stables in the barn to clean out as well, of my own. This was Daryl's routine for over a decade. Enslaved on the Welsh farm, not only did he give his labour for free, he also gave his liberty, and the farm's owners had no intention of ever letting him go. I'd done something wrong on the farm, and he chucked a piece of wood at me, and I thought, I ain't sticking this no more. So I tried to run from the farm. Desperate to escape, Daryl tried to flee the area, but his captors had other ideas. So he got in his motor one day and said, if you don't get back to this farm, I'll kill you. Daryl, get in the back. Come on, get in here. Wait. I didn't try and get away after. Daryl was now trapped and living in conditions that weren't even fit for a dog. First six, eight months, I, I slept in a shed with rats running about. And then for the rest of the time, I was in a caravan with a broken door, 
with no heater. There was a toilet, but that that was broke. I had to get a bucket of water and a stick to clean it out. There was a tap by the trough. I had to go and have a wash every time. A cold, cold wash. Well, no tough brush and no tough paste at all. If I had anything wrong with my teeth, they'd tell me to go over to the girls and ask them for whiskey to get rid of the pain. It was time for the police in Wales to take action. Paul Cole was part of the major incident team for Gwent Police. It's probably not in Daryl's nature to speak ill of people, uh, and Daryl, um, at the time, didn't really express any concerns of the, the day he was recovered. My belief is that that was due to the fear that he was still in the presence of his, uh, of his captors, if you like. Once it became clear that there were um, issues and uh, serious concerns with regards to the manner in which he'd been kept at the farm, that's when the investigation went into full swing, effectively. The police investigation began in earnest, but the charges they were looking at were unlike any other they'd ever dealt with before. That of slavery. This was an horrendous crime, and if you can imagine, it blew away the myth that slavery was all about prostitution and that it was about girls and women being brought from Africa or Eastern Europe. This was one of our own British subjects who'd been held, and we eventually found out he'd been held for 13 years. Every day of that 13 years being Groundhog Day. He worked long hours from, from early in the morning till late in the evening. He suffered horrendous exploitation. And Daryl was the key to getting a conviction. Daryl's mum, Jean, uh, describes him as timid and easily led. Um, and on that basis, um, he, there was a lot of work to do with Daryl. And he was interviewed over a period of three, we three weekends or so, given the stress uh, of reliving that trauma, the tra traumatic nature of given that information. We couldn't just sit there for hours and hours and hours and interview Dowell without expecting him to be able to have a break, get away from it. Seven months after Darrell's rescue, the police had finally gathered enough evidence to make some arrests. Suspects were interviewed, um, and ultimately, um, people were charged. This is groundbreaking in as far as Gwent Police were concerned with regards to the legislation that we were prosecuting under. There were three sort of strands to, to the legislation we were using. One was slavery, one was servitude, and one was forced labour. Um, we were looking at forced labour in relation to Darrell. Ultimately, one of the people charged made it to sentencing. A man called David Daniel Doran pleaded guilty to forced labour. On the 24th of October, 2014, at Cardiff Crown Court, the whole Simister family were present to hear his fate. We were sat on the left-hand side and all his family were sat the other side. Darrell was very intimidated. He sat right up against the wall, out the way, and he told us after, he said, the one of them kept looking at me and glaring at me. He said, no, I didn't like it. Well, nervous, really. Hands were sweating when we got into court. And uh, the judge has called his name out and asked for Dan Doran to come out. So he's walked out with a police officer, well, s some person. The judge um, explained how vulnerable Daryl was. He was very critical of the way that Dan Duran Jr. had treated him and he said that Daryl was basically a slave. And I think for the family, that meant a lot because um, that's exactly how they feel. They feel like this was slavery. This was a difficult legal case because the law relating to slavery had only come into effect in 2010. So the judge could only sentence Doran for the period of 2010 up to Daryl's rescue in 2013. And when he said he's only got four and a half years, I'm thinking to myself, I've got 13 years of my life for that, and he's only got four and a half. Sentences, they're not, they're not strong enough for these people. They haven't only ruined Daryl's life, they've ruined ours. 
We've had 13 years of heartache and he's had 13 years of working for them for nothing. For 13 years, the 13 years that he was held as a slave, he may, no guarantee, but he may have found a girlfriend and got married and had children, whereas now he will find that more difficult. He is still suffering. Although he tells you every day he's fine. If you ask him tomorrow, he's fine. If you ask him the next day, he's fine. But he's still suffering. And the perpetrators are enjoying life again. And I find it difficult to understand. Mr Doran only served 23 months in prison and is now a free man. But it's not so easy for Daryl and his family to walk away. It's, it, it's just so hard for people to comprehend what you've been through. It's like, well, you've got him home, just get on with it, you know. Be happy. He's, you've got him home, he's in one piece. But it's, it's the mental and the, you know, physical, you know, side of Daryl. We, we don't know what's going on in his head, and because he doesn't talk to you about it, you can't understand. You, you know, you, you imagine what's happened to him. And it's just hard, you know, that he... I can't believe that he just copes like he does. The one good thing to come out of Daryl's groundbreaking case is that others might not suffer as he did. But as a result of that case, the media attention that we got, we could not have expected. It shone a light on the fact that slavery, if it was taking place in Wales, it could take place anywhere. That's all I hope is through Daryl, a lot more people are saved, or they're res you know they're rescued, alive, safe, you know, looked after safely. And now the family are doing their best to make up for the life that Daryl missed. It's been perfect actually. Got my own bungalow. My mum had to get well, mum and dad had to sort that out for me. Everybody's been helping out, getting new stuff in and stuff, new carpet. Well, the knit and sorted that out. My nephew, he's sorted all the carpet out, and everybody else has been helping out. They've pulled together really well, I think. I've seen them; they're going on a few holidays, you know. They've um, and they've tried their best to get Daryl back to doing the things he really loved. So they've taken him to the races, to the dogs as well. Um, they take him quite often to see his football team, which he loves. For the next 30, 30 years, find a decent woman and settle down with her and a couple of kids and get married. You know, even as I say this, I find it shocking that Daryl Simister, a man who lives in the UK in the 21st century, was forced into slavery for 13 years. And you know, here's the shocking thing. Daryl is by no means alone. Last year in this country, it was estimated that over 3,000 people found themselves in a similar position. But out of the grim circumstances of this appalling crime, one good thing has emerged, because Daryl's case and others like it were part of an important background that forced Parliament finally to act. And in 2015, the law was changed, punishing those like Daryl's captors with extremely long custodial sentences. After the break, a son persuades his grieving mother to hand over her inheritance. Paul said, don't worry about it, I said, we'll make sure we look after Mum for you. But what was to follow would be the ultimate betrayal. When I kept saying to him, I needed money just to stay for gas and electric, well, you've got to manage on what you got.
The cases that affect you as a lawyer aren't necessarily the ones you might expect. Sometimes, the matters that affect you most are those where deception and treachery strike at the core of a family. I felt the same when I read the case of Shelley Roylands. Plymouth on the south coast of Devon, where in March 1973, local girl Shelley first met the love of her life, Royal Navy recruit Rob Roylands. It was two weeks after when Rob proposed to me, and I can still remember it that night. And he just pulled me, pulled me into a shop doorway and he just got down on his knees, and I'm thinking, what are you doing? And on the 21st of July that same year, the couple were married. Then I fell pregnant with Paul in the October, and then Rob went away in the January. He was away for six months, but I'd had Paul just before he'd come home. Over the next five years, Shelley and Rob also welcomed daughter Amanda and youngest son Peter. And in the years that followed, life for the family was good. It was a happy household, you know. I mean, we always had family time on a Sunday together and we were never treated differently. And it was a happy, loving home. You know, plenty of affection, plenty of love. My relationship with my brothers was really good. Uh, they were very protective of me, being their only sister. Um, we were close. Yeah, my relationship with my brother Paul was always close. We, were, we was really, we was like best friends as opposed to brothers. Rob and Shelley's marriage also continued to stand the test of time. Fantastic guy, brilliant dad, such a loving person. He wasn't just my husband, he was my best friend and everything. Amanda, Paul and Peter eventually flew the nest and went on to have families of their own. And with the children gone, Shelley and Rob were finally enjoying some quality time together when they received some devastating news. Dad got diagnosed with leukaemia to begin with. After a couple of years, they discovered it had spread to different places. I mean, I, I was actually with Dad at the hospital when he found out that it was gonna kill him and he only had limited amount of time. When we found out he had the cancer, um, it was quite a shock. It's gone to me. I've just been diagnosed with cancer of the spine, and I'm not joking, I'm on the floor now in the heat. I thought I could not believe I was hearing this. Felt like my heart had been torn in two when we were told Dad was terminal. Rob didn't have long to live, so the whole family pulled together to make sure his final months were comfortable. Well, it was in within sort of 10 months that we lost him. I mean, I lost him on the 27th of October in 2012. We was all stood round him when he went and everything, and not... Death's never perfect, but in my eyes, it was as perfect as it could be, as in all of my dad's loved ones were round him, we was all at his side, holding his hand and all that kind of stuff, so... Death's never perfect, but I think it was as perfect as it could be in the circumstances. After 39 years of marriage, Shelley had lost her soulmate. He had... A lovely personality. He would do anything for anybody. And I'm not just not just saying that, he would just go and do anything for anybody. If I end up being a tenth of the father that he was, then I'll be a good father in my eyes because he was amazing. Rob had been careful to ensure Shelley would be well provided for after his death. We knew Dad had life insurance and stuff, he'd taken them out. You hear so many times of people struggling with funeral costs and things like that. So before Dad was even poorly, he wanted to make sure that he had life insurance. An eldest son, Paul, had been made executor of the will. Dad didn't want Mum having that stress, so he asked my brother if he could take care of funeral, take, take care of all the stuff that has to be done after someone dies. That's what Paul said. Don't worry about it. I said, we'll make sure we look after Mum for you. Shelley had inherited a substantial amount of money thanks to Rob's provisions, and she was quick to share some of it amongst her loved ones. Because I gave my children, like, £500 each, and then obviously, because I've got 10 grandchildren at the time, so they had, like, £250 each off for me, and obviously, I paid for Rob's funeral as well out of that. But shortly after Rob's death, Shelley was struggling to cope with the loss. So when son Paul offered to look after her money, she happily accepted, 
considering it one less thing to worry about. He said to me at the time, um, Mum, we're looking out for your welfare and what have you. He said, do you want to put the £45,000 of that money into my nationwide? At the time, I was quite vulnerable, under really bad depression and everything, and I'd done it. Within sort of two days, I'd done it. For any parent, knowing that you have children to turn to in your times of need is really important for well-being. And when you're dealing with a significant loss, you can look to your children as you get older to help support you. So it's completely natural that when you are confused about what's happening with your finances or you need to sort certain things out around you in your world, you're going to talk to your most trusted advisors and they will hopefully be the people that you've brought up, your own children. Paul had agreed to give Shelley a monthly allowance, but as time passed by, he stopped being true to his word, and she was soon struggling to make ends meet. When I kept saying to him, I needed money just to stay for gas and electric, well, you've got to manage on what you got. I said, but you promised me I would get so much back a month, and I said, you not even kept to your word. When Paul had suggested he look after the money, he'd also told Shelley not to tell his brother and sister. She was confused and emotional, so Shelley didn't know where to turn. I imagine she was making excuses for him. I imagine she was thinking that he would pay the money back. And to actually verbalise it, to actually tell somebody, it's almost like it's making it a reality. Mourning the loss of her husband, at this stage emotionally vulnerable and virtually penniless, Shelley began to question where her money had gone. But she would soon discover that the truth would be far worse than she could ever have imagined. Even though Shelley had given Paul free reign over her finances, he was bound by trust to act in good faith. His dishonesty, however, was a criminal act of theft and a breach of trust of the worst kind. After the break, things go from bad to worse for Shelley. I reckon there's probably times she sat there in the dark till she's got paid because her electric's gone or whatever. I've sold all my jewellery. I even sold Rob's wedding ring. But would she find the courage to report the matter to the police? And then she said to me, do you think I should call the police? And as a person, I do, but only you can make that decision. After losing her husband of 39 years, Shelley Roylance, who was suffering from depression, thought her eldest son, Paul, would be the best person to look after her finances. So she didn't hesitate in handing over the 45,000 pounds she had received from her husband's life insurance policy. But it soon became clear that her son, Paul, did not have his mother's best interests at heart. The months passed by, and Shelley continued to see very little of the money she'd given to Paul for safekeeping. With the bills mounting up, the situation became desperate. She hasn't officially told me, but I, I reckon there's probably times she sat there in the dark till she's got paid because her electric's gone or whatever. In fact, things got so bad that she ended up having to sell her most prized possessions. I've sold all my jewellery. 
I even saw Rob's wedding ring. Um, gold bracelets, gold necklaces and everything that he bought me in the past. Because I needed the money to go out and buy food and everything. And when I've done that, I was absolutely devastated that I had to go and do it. Because I even mentioned to Paul, I had to go and flog my rings and everything. It seemed like he just didn't even care about it. She's having to sell her wedding ring just to make enough money so she can feed herself. That's humiliating, it's degrading, it's painful because she's giving away things that had great sentimental value to her. Not wanting to cause a family rift and embarrassed by her actions, Shelley kept her financial situation secret. But after 12 months, it became clear to younger son Peter that something was very, very wrong. I was living at Mum's house at the time, and every single day, my mum was in a foul mood. She was having a go at me all the time, but then bursting down in tears, and I'm like, this, this ain't my mum. I know she's going through grief, but this isn't my mum. And I'm like, what, what's actually going on, mum? Come on, tell me. There's something. Yeah, she, she broke down in tears and told me what had happened. She kept it secret from me because she was embarrassed about it. She'd embarrassed it, she'd let it happen. I couldn't believe that my brother could do that to my mum. You know, my mum was already suffering because of losing her husband of 39 years, and he went and did that. And then she said to me, do you think I should call the police? And I said, personally, I do, but only you can make that decision. It was still to be several more months before Shelley found the courage to make that call. And eventually, almost a year and a half after Rob's death, on the 17th of March, 2015, she contacted the police. I've done it in the end. I've done it on my own. Phoned up the police station, and I said, I need to phone up to say my son stole £45,000 off of me. One of the big problems when it's familial crime, particularly when it involves money, is that lots of family members are very reticent to involve the police because they feel that there is nothing worse than making their child or parent or sister or brother face a criminal conviction. And that's why many people have delay tactics. They don't want to face it. They want this other person to make it right. PC Pete Riley was a duty detective that day and took on the case. As he's currently working undercover, in order to protect his identity, he is played by an actor. The crime report was allocated to me to investigate almost immediately after Shelley Roylance reported the matter to Crown Hill Police Station in Plymouth. Owing to the impact and profound effect the crime had on Mrs Roylance, I made the decision to obtain her evidence through an ABE interview. ABE means achieve best evidence. It's a video recorded victim or witness interview in a comforting environment, like a room with a sofa, pictures. It's not based in a police station. Mrs. Roylance broke down in tears, telling me she was forced to sell her late husband's wedding and engagement rings to fund basic amenities such as gas and electricity. The police investigation began, and it did not take long to discover exactly what Paul had done with the money. Once they obtained the suspect's bank statements, it was straightforward. He spent the money on jewellery, TVs, laptops and other technology, claiming some of the items were bought with his mother's consent and for his own use. This is a lie as all items were located at his home address. He spent £45,000 electrical goods, games, jewellery and designer clothes. It made me feel like it had been my brother's intentions all along. From when he found out my dad was ill, persuaded my dad to make him executive of the will, and then persuaded mum to pay the money in, I, I feel that that was his motive all along, was to get my mum and dad's money. On the 11th of April, 2015, Paul was arrested at his home address on suspicion of the theft of £45,000.
I saw him in between. I was in a uh, supermarket doing my shopping, and I bumped into him, and he just went, all right, sis, as if everything was OK and nothing had gone on, and I just went, all right, and I walked away. I didn't even stand and chat to him. If uh, the arrest affected Mum, I think, after she phoned the police, because Mum only lives 10 minutes' walk away from my brother's house, and I think she 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 kept herself locked away for long periods of time because she was scared she'd go to the shop and bump into him. She'd become a bit of a recluse for a little while and locked herself away. And obviously, she was also devastated because it's her baby, and she phoned the police on her baby, you know? And she didn't want, she didn't want to do that, but she didn't have no other choice. Eventually, Paul was formally charged for theft in November 2015. Initially pleading his innocence, as the evidence grew, he changed his plea to guilty. A sum of money they could prove he had taken from his mother was actually £30,000. Both myself and Peter went to court. Uh, Mum didn't want to, because at the end of the day, he's, he's still her son. Um, we stayed away from where Paul and that was. He looked sorry for himself when he was sat in the dock. As in, he, he was sat with his head down and stuff, so he, he looked sorry for what he'd done. PC Riley come out and see me on the Saturday and said to me that he admitted to what he'd done. They said that he was going to be put inside for 20 months. Because he pleaded guilty to what he'd done, they said that he wouldn't have to give me none of the money back. Unfortunately, I don't think there would ever be any fair justice outcome for Mrs Roylance. The Crown Court heard how poor Roylance had no funds to repay the money. It, all of it had been spent. Mrs Roylance has found her family torn apart from Paul Roylance's actions. She now has little money. Peter Roylance and Amanda Roylance, Mrs Roylance's other two children, have also lost out on any financial support from their late father's estate, all because of the greed and arrogance displayed by Paul Roylance. The money I get, by the time I paid all my bills and everything and food and stuff, I'm not left with a lot of money. You know, and I thought it wouldn't be so bad if he offered to say, oh, Mum, I'll give you so and so back a month. But when he said in the court he can't afford to give me nothing back. In fact, Paul spent only six months in prison while Shelley had been left with a lifetime of suffering. She is very depressed. She hardly ever leaves her house. I mean, I don't sleep at night time because I've got a lot of stuff going on because of what happened and everything. But I don't sleep. I'm lucky sometimes if I get back to I always sleep at night. Even if my mum forgave him, the tears I've seen that lady shed and the worry I've seen her go through, I could not ever forgive him. I recognised the impact was not only the crime had on Mrs Voylance, but also the actual investigation. It was draining for her and has left her with distinct depression and associated problems. I, for one, have witnessed the decline from time of report to present day. This is all on Paul Roylance. I'm sorry to say this, but he's dead as far as I'm concerned. I want nothing ever to do with my brother again. He, you don't do that to your mum. There's this big misconception that if a member of the family does something bad to you, it's not as bad as a stranger because you know them. But actually, that's completely incorrect. When you know someone, love someone, trust someone, have a relationship with them, welcome them into your home, and then they betray you, and they act in a criminal way towards you, that breaches all of your trust levels. Suddenly, if you can't trust the people that you've invited into your world that you've known for years, then who can you trust? It makes the world a really unsafe place. Although Paul had permission to deal with his mother's assets, he was bound by law to protect her money. 
So when he took everything dishonestly for himself, he committed a crime of the most serious kind. His mother was vulnerable and by this stage nearly destitute. Now because Roylance had spent all of the money, the court had very little power to force him to pay any of it back. What's more, after a relatively short custodial sentence, Paul is now a free man.